Please welcome to the stage Andy Serwer, editor in chief, Yahoo Finance, and our distinguished panel. Good to see you. All right, welcome. This panel is Global Volatility, a bird's eye view. And uh, I'm delighted to have a couple of eagles here, or leading lights, should I say. Ian Bremmer, founder and president of the Eurasia Group, John Stosinski, vice chairman of Blackstone. Both are much more than that, as you'll soon find out. Um, very interesting perspectives. And what does that mean? You guys know each other a little bit, but you've never done this kind of thing together before, is that right? That's right. No, this is, um, the, obviously, the uh, Concordia Summit is taking some risk in having us both together in a panel in public. That's so, risk uh, unto itself. I absolutely. think that's right. All right, um, Ian, let me start with you. You know, people always ask Ian Bremmer, tell me about the problems and all these different challenges and all these terrible countries doing terrible things and these terrible groups. But I'm gonna turn that on its head. What are the good things going on in the world, Ian? And where are the positive things that you can take advantage of? Well, I guess there are two big good things. Um, one, the simple one, is that there is leadership, um, particularly in Asia right now. Uh, you know, China is doing a lot better than a lot of people have been worried and fearing about for the last 10 years consistently, the shoe that consistently hasn't really dropped, right? I mean, the only thing worse than China becoming a greater competitor to the U.S. is China failing. No one's really worried about a hard landing right now. No one's really worried about, uh, you know, Japan going to war with China. No one's really worried about the South China Sea exploding. Uh, and in India, we have a strong leader, too. But the, the bigger thing that I think is the opportunity is that crisis brings out the best in uh, potentially strong leaders. Uh, and they sometimes come from very unusual uh, parts of the world. I think about how we ended up moving on the Paris Accord for climate, not because governments got it right, but because a bunch of CEOs and mayors said we've got to do more. I think of where Pope Francis is today, uh, an organization, the Catholic Church, that lost a lot of credibility, but he's actually driving um, you know, so much more agenda setting on issues that really matter. I, I think that in a world where we're going to see a lot more crises, you're going to find that the solutions are going to come from very unorthodox uh, corners of the world. And, and that, that'll, that'll surprise us. Uh, I think that's an important one. I want to talk more about the Pope with John in a few minutes. But John, let me ask you, you are an advisor to CEOs and other business executives. What is the best way for them to stay abreast of what's going on in the world. How, how can business leaders best study and react and respond to what's going on in the geopolitical realm? Well, apart from being a client of the Eurasia Group and uh, getting Ian Bremmer's Monday note, mm. which is impeccably good uh, in terms of what's going on around the world, um, I find the most... <laughs> This is an interesting environment. People talk about volatility. You mentioned volatility. We're not really talking about market volatility right now. The markets, for the most part, are fairly stable, but that's why we have a very strong stock market. I think the elephant in the room and what people are worried about, which requires more CEO and more board attention and scrutiny, is the sort of broad range of geopolitical issues, risks, scenarios that we're all testing. And if you were to list just 10 scenarios, whether it's North Korea, what Russia's doing in the Ukraine, what Russia's doing in Eastern Europe, um, the reemergence of China and the issue of the South China Sea, um, the reconciliation of the Arab Spring, Iraq, Syria, Brexit, Europe in terms of the far right, far left, the US presidential election, the resolution of populism in Latin America. There's 10 things there. Let's say you assign a 5 or 10% probability to each one. The only way a board and a CEO is going to be comfortable is if that board and that CEO spends time around the world and has a sense of judgment about what's really likely to happen. So this notion that you can run a multinational firm with a big staff everywhere is true. 
but the actual board and the CEO <coughs> has got to be very much on top of what's going on globally and have not just facts and information, but develop an intuition and a judgment. John, um, you travel the world a fair amount. What do people there ask you about uh, Donald Trump? And what do you tell them? Um, I think uh, what, I ask, what I tell them is that everything that the media discusses is worth reading. Um, what I tell them is that um, Donald Trump, similar to what we've seen with Brexit, is um, about the emergence of a form of um, populism in America. And we know what constitutes populism. It has to do with uh, a perception of um, economic um, uh, people having a certain amount of um, economic uh, inequality, immigration risks, uh, concerns about financial instability, um, and then to a certain extent, distortion and corruption, which, you know, in terms of how the truth is, is presented, you saw that with Brexit, you're seeing that with certain aspects of the U.S. presidential election, which creates a demagogue. Um, and to a certain extent, um, people are interested in that. But I think they're all, also interested in the fact that we're now living in a new era of a reaction to political correctness. I think we've all had enough of political correctness. And I think what um, the, the fresh thing about Donald Trump is, he, he doesn't try to be politically correct. He's, he's direct, he's honest in his own words, and to a certain extent, that's, that's one element that people are responding to. Ian, let me put it to you, but before I do that, I, I just have to say nice socks, dude. Um, is there a Trump risk, or indeed, Trump opportunity? Well, on the foreign policy stage, there's not much of an opportunity uh, in the sense that every foreign minister of every American ally believes that if Trump comes in, the U.S. commitments are going to deteriorate and that they're going to have to hedge. So if there are opportunities, they won't be for the U.S. Trump is, I think, from a global perspective, a fairly unmitigated negative. The real question is how much of a negative? And historically, uh, political risks around developed countries, particularly the U.S., don't matter very much because at the end of the day, an individual president can only move the needle so much. It's not like what would happen if you have a dramatically different government in Brazil or Russia or Turkey or what have you. But, but I, I do think that um, with someone who is as far away from the American mainstream, such as we believed it to be, um, as Trump, someone who is as similar in personal kind of uh, disposition as he is to Erdogan in Turkey, someone who, a, a really brittle personality, very insecure, very narcissistic, deeply authoritarian. Um, the potential for him to do serious and lasting damage to America's consolidated democratic institutions, if there were a crisis, not sort of standard day to day, but if there were a crisis, the reaction to uh, uh, another 9-11, God forbid, the reaction to another 2008 financial crisis, that kind of thing. Or a coup well, there. Uh, well, look, at the end of the day, the reaction to, or an assassination attempt, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you can come up, uh, you know, a contagion. You know, as you, as you look around the world, um, People have different views of, um, you know, of um, the United States. I think in four years, whether it's because of social media or the millennials or whatever, you know, th this country's two-party system is clearly out of date. Europe does not function any longer, hasn't functioned for a long time on two-party systems. They function on multiple parties, Coalitions come and go, parties rise and fall. You've seen that now in the UK where you have a one-party system de facto with Prime Minister Theresa May and the Tory party. You've seen that in Germany, you see that elsewhere in France. The coalition framework is what people are used to. The sort of, the, the structure, the rigidity of the two-party system, which almost is designed and should be almost challenged from the standpoint of a monopolistic or duopolistic uh, regulation is such that 
it, people are looking at it and they're puzzled why this two-party system can't allow the broader range of talent to run in the presidential election. And I think that's a question I get around the world. And I think coalitions, I'd be interested in Ian's view on this because you see, as you travel in Europe, coalition politics is just a fact of life and people live with it. And it's, whether it's Spain or the UK or Germany, and people actually can assimilate each other's ideas on a much more practical level and the, the consumer, the voter, can identify with that. Well, yeah, go ahead, Ian. I mean, just a quick point, John. You know, we've seen third-party candidates for a while, going back to John Anderson and Ross Perot, and we've talked about it. It doesn't seem to have happened yet. What's your take, Ian? Well, I mean, the United States has a political system that has a lot more money uh, from special interests and the private sector that are able to capture uh, political interests, that are able to have individual members of Congress become entrepreneurs that really are loyal to them as opposed to the party structure. Secondly, there's not as much urgency in the United States. That's clearly starting to change, though not in the U.S. markets, as you say, where in France, you know, given the level of terrorism that they've experienced, given where the front national is, in Germany, given the million-plus refugees that have been accepted by Angela Merkel, in the U.K., given what's happening on Brexit, the urgency is much greater. The United States also more decentralized. So, I mean, part of it is that we don't yet have the crisis, I, I personally am not sure the turnout is going to be very high in this election. There are so many people that are disaffected. Historically in the U.S., losers don't vote. In India, the, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to turn out. In the United States, you also have people saying, including Trump, that, you know, sort of this is going to be rigged. At the end of the day, I think a lot of the disenfranchised in the U.S. aren't necessarily yet, at least, clamoring for true change, where in Europe, that's clearly not the case. And even Merkel, who's had the system that's by far the most stable, is now feeling that in the most liberal of German cities mm. in Berlin, Berlin, where even there, the alternatives for Deutschland, the populist party, mm. just nearly hit 15% from zero in the last election. That's quite something. You mentioned terrorism, and of course, you know, we're living here just in the, it seems, in the wake of an immediate terror incident. Um, how does this play out in the United States, Ian? How much worse can it get? What do you anticipate? Well, look, I mean, it's very clear that terrorism in the U.S. is nowhere close to the threat it is in Europe, and in Europe it's nowhere close to what it is across the extended Middle East. But that doesn't mean that we won't focus on it as a big issue. Um, I, I, I have sympathy uh, that, I mean, on the one hand, President Obama is wrong not to talk about radical Islam when radical Islam is a big part of the problem. On the other hand, I understand that, you know, after 9-11, um, the damage done by the United States by overreacting through extensive and incredibly expensive and misdirected wars in Iraq and to a degree in Afghanistan um, did more damage to the United States than anything else that has happened globally in 25 years since the end of the Cold War. So it's a hard one. I do know that the politicization of terrorism is one of the things that plays well to a Trump candidacy. Um, and, and frankly, it's all of this extraneous stuff. It's Hillary's health, um, it's uh, Russian hacks, um, and, and it's terrorism. All of these things are starting to play. We've got seven weeks left. I'm not at all sanguine uh, that we've seen the end of any of those things, and that's clearly gonna have lasting effects, not just in November, but more broadly on the way we think about what values we stand for in this country. Fasten your seatbelts. John, I have to ask you about Brexit. You've spent so much time in the UK. Um, did it surprise you? Is the, um, have the results surprised you? Know, I was talking to Jim Rogers, the investor, and he predicted when it happened there was going to be this massive bull market that would ensue. In fact, that hasn't happened. Um, what does Brexit mean? Where do we go from here? Implications of the US? Uh, well, to, to quote, our new prime minister, who is um, who's fabulous, um, Brexit means Brexit, um, and uh, she said it once, she said it twice, she said it at least 25 or 50 times. Um, no one expected Brexit. I was expecting 52-48 in favor of Remain. Um, I still believe that. Um, 
and Ian's heard me say this many times, the result will be remain in all but name. Uh, there'll be strong renegotiation on issues like movement of certain types of people, but there will be, there'll be clear movement of labor within certain companies, certain industries. People will be given a certain amount of time to um, find a job, uh, but it'll probably cost. I, I remember the Norwegian prime minister saying to me, don't, don't, don't support Brexit because you'll get what you want, you'll get your restrictions on immigration, but it'll cost you a lot more money and you'll have no seat on the table. So that's effectively probably what we'll have. I mean, I think the issue is Mrs. May, rightly so, has got to wait to trigger Article 50 because she needs to know who the key players are across the table. All of you who negotiate, you know, you want to know who you're negotiating with. There's an election coming up in Germany, in France, the two major players. You need to know who you're dealing with. They will have an influence on who, who might be playing some senior roles in Brussels. Uh, there's a referendum coming up in Rome. Uh, that could also have an impact on uh, the leadership of that country. So there's a lot of moving pieces. So until you actually know the players, um, people shouldn't be panicking that Article 50 hasn't been triggered. Um, there's going to be a period of uncertainty. There's going to be a period of volatility. I think people are realizing the UK is a big, complicated economy. Um, but we have to look forward to where things are in five years. I promised I was going to ask you about the Pope. So he seems to be one of the true leaders of the world right now. Um, how would you assess his performance? Could he be even better? What do you expect from him? Um, well, that wonderful expression, come the moment, come the man. He is the man or the person for the moment. Um, he is a Jesuit, and for those of you who know about Jesuits, they believe in change in society from educating the poor and teaching literacy. So he fundamentally believes that. He's lived in some of the toughest parts of the world. Um, having said that, um, he really believes, and he's, he's someone who's relevant for this point in history, Andy, not just because of economics, um, but there's that wonderful line from the Bible, um, teach a man to fish and you've, you know, give a man a fish or teach a man to fish. He's very much in the teach a man to fish. And the, the reason for that is not just about, it's an efficient way to promote education, to create economic instability, but he understands, and this is the issue of the world right now, and this is why populism is getting so out of control. People are worried about their jobs, they're worried that they're not participating in economic upturn, they feel disenfranchised from government, they're worrying about living longer and having less money, and they're living, they feel that technology is going to disintermediate and destroy their jobs. The notion of teaching, retraining, and keeping people in the workforce is something the Pope is very focused on because he knows it relates to your dignity and your self-esteem. And that's the essence of how he thinks. So, he, and he's, remember, he's not elected and no one edits him. As a matter of fact, his press office would probably, would like to edit him more but he is very much his own person. Ian, let's talk about one of your favorite subjects I know, which is Russia <laughs> and Vladimir Putin. Um, so is that really your favorite subject? He, I don't know. he likes to know. talk about he it. He likes Mrs. Merkel. I don't know if he, liking he to talk Merkel. about it is different from liking it. He prefers Mrs. Merkel to Vladimir Putin, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> um, my question is, you know, how big of a risk and, and how much of a paper bear is it or is it the real deal? And does Trump, in a sense, give Putin the license to act out even more? I do believe that, that Trump would be a good president for Putin. I, I mean, you, you know, mean, for he, Russian interests, meaning, or for Putin's interests? Uh, both, hmm. both. And of course, they're increasingly very aligned. I mean, Putin does want a more zero-sum world. He particularly does not like the idea of, and you know, sort of 
indispensable America, uh, an exceptionalist America. Trump has made it very clear that he wants to move the country in a very different direction. So I, I, I don't think it's just the authoritarian bravado. I actually think ideologically their worldviews are, are actually quite simpatico. But Putin's in a lot of trouble. And I don't mean that domestically. He just, you know, won big time parliamentary elections with his own party, uh, you know, sort of capturing someone 70 plus percent of the seats yesterday, though turnout was low um, in Moscow and Petersburg because people are kind of getting sick of um, the, the politics there. Mm. Um, but, but, you know, if you think that Russia has gotten agitated at the Americans for NATO enlargement, and missile defense in Eastern Europe and EU encroachment and all of this stuff, Ukraine, that's nothing compared to what's gonna happen when the Chinese invest a trillion dollars in every country around Russia and dominate not only economic influence but political influence as a, as a consequence. And, and these are countries the Russians really think of as theirs. That is inexorably coming. Really, and, like and, a game of risk. Well, yeah, and you don't want to be, I mean, you remember, it was never fun to play Ukraine in risk, right? Because, I mean, yeah. you just can't defend that nonsense, right? Yeah, right? You just no, can't really. do it. Um, I, I, I think this isn't next year, but Putin's there for the long haul, right? I mean, over the next five and ten years, I think that Russia's probably in, you know, with the, with the potential exception of Turkey, in the worst geopolitical situation of any major economy in the world, and, and I say that looking at a Russia which has tremendous offensive cyber capabilities and a willingness to use it, mm. and tremendous traditional military capabilities and a willingness to use it. So I, I, I think that, you know, do I think it's a world risk? No, but in the region, um, no question, their neighbors, and Russia, China is a much bigger problem than Russia, US long term. Quick follow up question is Putin playing Trump or Trump playing Putin? I think they're playing each other. I think it's, it's actually very consistent. I don't think it's about the secret, you know, sort of monetary deals of Paul Manafort, who was yeah. ousted, that sort of thing. I, I, I really think that, um, you know, Trump looks at a Putin and says, here is a strong leader, and this guy's been playing Obama, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, you know, sort of make some points off that. And Putin looks at Hillary, who he can't stand, and he also does, as we know from Merkel, Putin does have a female issue when it comes to being in the room with another head of state. Um, and, and he absolutely would prefer Trump as well. It, the stars do align here. Let's keep in mind, if you look at leaders that actually support Trump around the world, you're talking about people with that ideological disposition. It's, you know, Farage, it's Geert Wilders, it's Le Pen, it's Hungary's Viktor Orban, who is a Putinophile, and it's Kim Jong-un, that's it. Oh, All right. Quite a bunch. <laughs> um, very little time left, and we still haven't talked about China, so I want to do that kind of quickly. John, people keep, you know, looking for an end game with China. In other words, you've got, um, you know, um, Jim Rogers is bullish. You've got Chanos is shorting the whole thing. It's got to either end here or here. But China seems to keep going like that, kind of in the middle. What's your take on how are things continue to unfold there? You know, China's a, um, the leadership of China is a class act. Um, it's the, the, the strongest leadership that China has seen uh, since Mao. Um, it is extremely um, well run. Um, you know, they actually have a, a method which when you compare the way the Chinese run their government and you compare it to the way the U.S. run the government, you go, what are we doing wrong? They actually, every hundreds and thousands of people across China are evaluated on their performance in government. They're evaluated annually and they keep records on everyone. And in two or three years when we go through the next five-year plan, 70% of the people will change. But it is entirely based on track record, performance, meritocratic principles. So it's sort of like the, what I would regard as the, the meritocratic flying geese formation. The Chinese put people in place across the country. You know, we've all seen that wonderful play about Lyndon Johnson and how he was in Congress, he was in the Senate, he was a governor, he was a vice president. Well, President Xi has played the role, has, has played four or five major roles across China. So by the time he has gotten to, into the strong leadership role, he knows what he's doing. 20 seconds, your take on China. 
Look, I, I agree. I think that Xi Jinping is incredibly popular at home, and uh, the average Chinese is happier with their government today than the average American is mm. with the U.S. government and system. And that's, this is a country that hasn't been elected, but 35 years of, on average, 10% growth will do a lot for you, and the anti-corruption campaign is very popular. Final point, though, is let's recognize the level of uncertainty around China over the next 10 years, despite all of this, is still vastly greater than the level of uncertainty in the United States, notwithstanding what's going to happen in seven weeks. Really, really fascinating stuff. Please join me in thanking Ian Bremmer and John Stadzinski. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.